Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's uh, humbling to know a group this large is gathering in St. Paul and, and an equally large group tomorrow in, in support of scouting. Many of you have been loyal, annual uh, supporters of scouting in this city. I'd also like to add my congratulations to Steve Lewis uh, for his recognition as our Scoutmaster of Philanthropy. So about five years ago, Fritz actually asked me to reactivate my involvement with scouting. And I have enjoyed uh, the people that I have met during these intervening five years much, much more than I could have expected. But more importantly, I've witnessed the power of scouting and the power of a volunteer-based organization to address some of the deepest ailments of our country. I come from a scouting family. My father was a scout. My brothers were scouts. My mother would have been a scout. Um, <clears throat> and virtually all of my friends, many of whom have remained friends throughout my life, came through scouting. I can readily look back and see the impact of our scout masters, Ernie Jelleberg and Oliver Dunderlin, on each of us in Troop 528, Botno, North Dakota, a little town on the Canadian border, 2,500 people, sponsored by the First Lutheran Church. I therefore associate scouting with the smell of lutefisk. And uh, <laughs> every year at Christmas, they permeated every curtain and every <laughs> portion of that church with the unmistakable odor of boiling fish. But we had a great troop. In a small town, we had enormous outdoor opportunities. And these scoutmasters were there to teach us usable skills, things like cooking a rhubarb pie in a Dutch oven over a fire, learning how to sleep in a hollowed out snowbank, and many other things. But clearly developed in all of us a love of the outdoors and appreciation for service to our small community. I didn't know as a young scout, but I later realized that I learned most of what I needed to prosper and grow at Cargill through my continuous attempts to adhere to the scout law. A scout is trustworthy, and I joined a company whose number one mantra for 150 years, and this year is the 150th year anniversary of Cargill, our word is our bond. A scout is loyal. I joined a company where long and loyal service is appreciated, honored, and is necessary. A scout is helpful. I joined a company where you're expected to see what needs to be done and to do it without being asked or told. A scout is friendly, courteous, and kind, and I have the great pleasure to have found and joined a company where first names are used and where the leaders are expected to greet acknowledge, honor, and show respect for every person they encounter. The scout is obedient, and I joined a company where adherence to seven simple guiding principles instruct all of the behavior of 150,000 people across the world. And that adherence was expected, and also a place where leadership and followership were part and parcel of the exact same attitude. The scout is cheerful. I joined a company whose leadership model calls out the expectation that you will demonstrate optimism. <laughs> it's just about how they present it, actually. <laughs> and to do that, especially in the presence of the inevitable setbacks that befall companies everywhere, but certainly companies involved in, in agriculture. A scout is thrifty. I joined a company with Scottish owners. <laughs> Honest to goodness, 1974, I don't think any Cargill owner that I met drove a car newer than 10 years old. But the other side of thrift is saving, and it was also a company that saved over 85% of the cash flow of the company and reinvested it in the future of our employees and of the business. A scout is brave, and I joined a company that honored people who, and, and valued people who had the courage to take a minority position, to voice respectful disagreement, and to demonstrate candor. A scout is clean. And this is the one that I had to stretch the most for, but certainly in Cargill, as a food company, if we do not meet our obligations around food safety, nothing else in our organization matters. 
And finally, a scout is reverent. And I had the very, very good fortune to join a company that works every day to respect the religious traditions and practices and convictions of all of our 150,000 employees across the globe. Given that one of my first merit badges was poultry husbandry, show of hands, <laughs> all, oh, thank John, okay, <laughs> zero. Oh, John was holding up. So, I stand here as a minority. <laughs> but poultry husbandry, and I ended up working in Cargill's animal protein business, uh, 18 or 20 years later. The brand promise for Boy Scouts, as you've seen uh, on the screens, is prepared for life. And in my case, to an enormous degree, that has been true. And as a result, I owe a great debt of gratitude to scouting. But many in our city are not born into homes with scouting traditions. Many of these children can benefit the most from the mentoring and teaching of a caring scoutmaster. They can begin a life of achievement through the earned self-esteem that comes from demonstrating mastery in a host of merit badge pursuits. They can learn the healthy benefits of competing with their peers in, in an environment that rewards learning and honors service to others. They can learn the joy of the outdoors, the healthy, the health-giving aspects of physical recreation. And I continue to read, and Martha mentioned it, with no small amount of disappointment, the statistics about the outdoor activities of our current youth, whether it's skiing or camping or even participation in baseball and other outdoor activities. I think the statistic cited was 14 minutes. This should not be the legacy of our generation, that we leave a youth inexperienced in, in the real joys of, of being outdoors. Two years ago at the Boy Scouts, National Convention, a speaker rose and noted that most social service organizations seek to make the world better for kids, a noble cause. But scouting seeks to make better kids for the world, and I think an even more noble cause. About a year and a half ago, I was in a gathering of, of business people, and Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago, was being interviewed on stage. And one of the questions he was asked to address was, was the issue of personal safety in his city. And he cited a host of statistics about homicides and the demographics of who were the perpetrators and who were the victims. And he shared with the audience in talking to the interviewer um, the fact that he attempted as mayor to call the home of every single victim and to express his condolences for what had uh, befallen their family. And he then said that in all of his calls, and by this time he'd been mayor, I think for close to five years, he said a dad had never answered the phone. And he turned on the stage to all of us, and I think some of you know Rahm Emanuel. We didn't know what to expect him to say and how colorfully it might be said. <laughs> but he turned and with his hands out like this, he said, I need more dads. And so I think that is a call that we can answer and that we should. So we all realize that the best time to change the trajectory of a child's life is at a very early age. Gabriela Mistral, a Chilean poet and educator, eloquently captured this truth. And she wrote, many things we need can wait. The child cannot. Now is the time her bones are formed and her mind developed. To him, we cannot say tomorrow. The need is today. Recruiting youngsters to Cub Scouts is critical to delivering the programs in the, uh, and complement the role of parents in the development of their children. Thanks to the over 15,000 adult registered volunteers in the Northern Star Council, we have the talent to deliver that fun the values-based and character-building experiences that only, amongst all the programs available, scouting can offer. But we must have that chance to introduce more children to Cub Scouts. Minnesota schools and scouting need to return 
to the natural partnership that historically existed here. Some time ago, Richard Niner, a past president of the Northern Star Council, circulated a quote by a gentleman named Parker Palmer, and I'm going to end with those comments. And each time I read them, I am inspired by their correctness and the call to action, and unfortunately discomforted by my personal answers to the questions he raises. He wrote, we are always being asked, how effective is our work? Are you getting results and outcomes? I don't object to that, but I'm convinced that there's a terrible problem when measured effectiveness is our only standard and we become utterly obsessed with outcomes and results. When that happens, what else happens is that we keep taking on smaller and smaller tasks because those are the only one we can get immediate measurable results with. If we want to take on big tasks, we need another standard by which to measure our actions, and that standard is faithfulness. I don't mean anything high and mighty by that. I mean, am I being faithful to the gifts that I possess, to the strengths and abilities that I bring to the world? Am I faithful to the needs I see around me? Am I faithful to those points at which I intersect the needs of the world and have the chance to serve? Do I enter that opportunity as complex and challenging as it is, or do I shy away, run away, for fear that I won't be able to serve well or that I'll be stretched beyond my ability to serve? So for all of us here, ours is the complex and challenging task of creating the next generation of citizens and parents our nation requires, indeed, to make better dads. Thank you for your support in providing scouting for a child who deeply needs it. Thank you. Thank you.